Village Connects. I'm very pleased to welcome the Honorable Ratna Omudvar, Senator for Ontario and Deputy Chair of the Special Senate Committee on the Charitable Sector. Senator Omidvar has over 30 years of experience working in the charitable sector at senior levels of management, as well as serving as a board director, volunteer, and advisor to many charitable boards. The Senator is an internationally recognized voice on migration, diversity, and inclusion. In 2016, she was appointed to the Senate of Canada as an independent Senator representing Ontario. Senator Omidvar was appointed to the Order of Ontario in 2005 and became a member of the Order of Canada in 2011, with both honours recognising her advocacy work on behalf of immigrants and her devotion to reducing inequality in Canada. Welcome to the podcast, Senator. Thank you, Mary, and thank you so much for, to Charity Village for having me, and to you, Mary, for pronouncing my name so beautifully. You have no idea how many of my colleagues in the Senate have a hard time with it. <laughs> thank you very, very much. I'm so glad that I got it right. Um, I, I, I'd like to dive right in and ask you, what role do you feel legislation can play in modernizing or creating a more equitable nonprofit sector? So legislation or the law uh, is is such a central feature of our society and in terms of charities and not-for-profits it derives all its uh, its uh, uh, capacity and its limitations from the income tax act because the income tax act is the law that governs how charities operate now this income tax act as it pertains to charity has not been reviewed for more than 60 or 70 years. And the stipulations in the Income Tax Act are frankly outmoded and go back to Elizabethan times. So that's the first challenge. Uh, how can we create a more equitable, not charitable sector? We need to reform the Income Tax Act. So just as one example, the definition of charity, if we have a definition of charity. Um, we actually have four heads of charity. We don't define what charity is, but those four heads of charity have not changed since whenever. And, and you know, there are charities in this very fast evolving modern day world that would not fit into the original four heads of charity. So I think we need to review the Income Tax Act. We need to uh, uh, think about should uh, 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 revoked or refused, should revoke charities or those who are refused charitable status, do they really need to go uh, to an appeals court or should they rather go to a tax court? Because the tax court is the court that manages all tax appeals. So it makes sense to me that lots of moving parts, not just the legislation, but also the regulations need to uh, be reviewed and modernized so that we can have more opportunity and more equity. Without changing the law, we will not get there. I understand. I, I also, uh, I just wanted to also go back and just talk about some of your work that you did on the Special Senate Committee on the Charitable Sector and specifically what the resulting report recommended in terms of supporting charities to pursue other forms of revenue, uh, including social enterprise. Could you describe what, what the report entailed there? We had a, a, a lot of witnesses talk about the constraints that charities face when raising money uh, through business ventures. And there's, you know, there's pros and cons to this argument. But in the end, we thought it was wise to open up this Pandora's box, if I may call it that. Um, and we asked uh, that uh, the CRA do, um, you know, it provide a greater, provide greater clarity on what is a related business, because right now, a charity can carry on a business if it's directly related to its mission, like, you know, museums, running museum shops and hospitals, running gift shops. But what happens when a charity uh, becomes a developer because it owns a piece of property? Is, is that a related business or non-related business? So I think charities need some clarity. In addition, uh, because every, every source of revenue is declining, 
for charities uh, and the only source of revenue that could be a potential game changer is business revenue. We also asked the CRA to conduct a pilot project to assess the viability of granting registered charities greater latitude in raising money as long as, and this is important, as long as the revenue is used to advance charitable purpose. This is what in legalese is called a destination of funds test. So the CRA could, could launch a pilot and say we are allowing you know, X number of charities or X number of business related activities. We're going to monitor whether the revenue really goes to further the charitable purpose. And then you'd gain some knowledge and you'd gain, you'd you'd have an evidence base. So we thought that was important. But I will say that this, uh, this recommendation uh, is, is, is a hotly contestable one. And it's contested, obviously, from businesses themselves. I mean, they would argue that charities already receive a tax benefit because the charitable dollar is non-taxable and that they, that char- charitably exempt uh, dollars should not be used to compete with business activities in the private sector. So there are shades of gray here. But again, you know, launching a pilot, doing some consultations, uh, you know, sort of thinking about the brave new world would be an important first step. Well, I I also understand, and we've all gone through it with the pandemic hitting the nonprofit sector so seriously that uh, charities found it difficult to address some of the issues of their infrastructure that they had to work on to be able to adapt uh, their services and their operations, for example, uh, operating digitally or virtually. because of the constraints on the way that they were able to spend their funds. Could you comment on that? I I think uh, what you're saying is bang on. The COVID crisis, uh, the rise of uh, digital uh, platforms, the use of artificial intelligence, all of this, all of these are new factors. They can be enabling factors or they can be disabling factors, you know, dependent on how you grab these opportunities. So I think we need sort of a wholesale rethink of uh, of, of, uh, these opportunities. I I will also throw in that um, charities need to to think about raising revenues uh, in different ways. And I want to point to the opportunity that is that is inherent in social finance and you know social finance brings doesn't bring donors to the table it brings investors to the table investors demand a return and i believe that there are many many investors who would be willing willingly uh, who would willingly engage in investing in public good activities uh, as long as they were able uh, to get uh, you know some kind of return maybe not the returns you would get in the market maybe you would get those returns i don't know but imagine if an investor wanted to invest in public housing for low income people uh, the the developing charity in this case Uh, needs to understand how to uh, work with an investor as opposed to a donor. And so you need to build the capacity of a two-way relationship that is completely new. So the investor needs to be to be uh, to be made aware or to learn how to work with a charity and a charity needs to learn how to work with an investor so these are the building blocks that are currently in place through the social finance fund it is operational uh, it is at the stage where you know uh, uh, these enabling capacity building mechanisms are being tested and tried uh, and then after that when there is a certain amount of capacity we hope to see new investments coming in to charitable purpose through social finance. I really was wondering what your thoughts were on the use of these alternate forms of revenue for nonprofit and charities, things like social enterprise, social finance, and impact investing, and other kinds of revenue generating tools. I mean, this is a a big change for uh, the existing nonprofit sector. You know, how easy or 
complicated does current legislation make it for these organizations who want to actually explore these areas? Very good question, Mary. There are, you know, in, in the public good space, we have charities, we have not-for-profits, we have social enterprises, we have co-ops, we have simple movements of people that are informal and there are you know there are some laws that regulate and legislate and there's an absence of agility and nimbleness to help the country i will not say the sector help the people of canada uh, move into uh into a more secure uh environments, whether that is food security or housing security or health security or income security, be, be that as it may. So we have to find enabling mechanisms to bring the world of, of uh, donors, investors, and public good uh, organizations in one room. And I think those, those their, their uh, uh, aspirations are not that different. The way they get there are different, but their aspirations are not. And I think it is entirely possible for those aspirations to be brought into one room in order to advance, as I said, the security of Canadians. I wonder whether the We Charity, the scandal that occurred, the sort of public attention that that garnered, whether that's perhaps impacted the sector in terms of public trust, but also in organizations' willingness to pursue alternative source, sources of revenue. What are your thoughts about that? I think it definitely had a dampening effect. I know that uh, when I wanted to table my legislation on charities, and I'm sure you'll ask me a question about that later, I held back, uh, hoping that the storm would blow over. Uh, I think it definitely had an impact because of the particular governance fog around, let me put it that way, around the We Charity and the We To Me and all their various, you know, there was a fog around it. And and the fog was a governance fog. That's that's my own conclusion. And and so the public was not able to see through the fog and and it was I think it was a difficult time for charities. But events, as Sir Winston Churchill said, events move everything. And then we got COVID. And I think during the COVID crisis, Canadians saw and appreciated how necessary, essential um, and and imperative the work of the charitable and not-for-profit sector is and was in keeping them safe. Uh, you know, I mean, there were all kinds of unintended outcomes. And who was there picking up the beds? Who was there helping women get into shelters? When uh, the stay-at-home uh, lockdown made, made the context impossible for them, who was it who was helping kids with mental health? Uh, when their mental health took a severe beating over the two years of the lockdown? Who was it who was looking after their food security when incomes dropped? When you think of all these things, Canadians saw in a, in a brilliant way, if I may use that, that the charitable sector and the not-for-profit sector are the veritable glue that who held us together. So I think the narrative shifted again a little bit. Time will tell. Uh, I think a number of reforms do need to be made, and these reforms need to be made by charities themselves. So sort of, uh, you know, I would say when charities have, uh, you know, choose to have one or two or three uh, uh, or organizations that are similar and correlated, they, they need to have uh, uh, governance uh, uh, parameters, no mixing of governors, as I would say, you know, you can't have, you know, the same governor sitting on the charity and the enterprise and the revenue generating uh, arm of the business. You need some clarity, you need some guardrails, you need some governance uh, 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 authenticity and integrity. But I think, again, that is not for the government as much as for the charitable sector itself to own. 
Well, you have uh, mentioned your uh, the kind of uh, activities that you've been heavily involved in recently. Can you provide some of the background and an introduction to the Bill S-216? How much time do we have, Mary? Because <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> no, we, I won't. I'll try and make it, uh, put it in a nutshell. But I will say this, that of the 42 recommendations that were put forward, forward by the Senate Charities Report, this particular one on which my legislation is based has been pinpointed as the most urgent by all corners of the sector. And it deals with... Uh, uh, with a stipulation in the Income Tax Act that states that charities uh, can use their charitable dollars in one of two ways. One, they can use the money directly uh, to provide their services, but these services have to be own activities. And two, they can grant dollars to another charity. So the problem is own activities. Those two words, own activities, prevents charities from working in partnership with others who are not charitable because those activities would not be the own activities of the charity. I hope I've, I'm making it a little clear because it is kind of technical in a way and sort of people's eyes glaze over when I start talking about about own activities. The, the trouble with the own activities uh, uh, language is that when a charity needs to work with a non-charity to advance its charitable purpose, then the only way they can work with the non-charity is by entering into a very arcane uh, uh, workaround, uh, which results in the charity imposing direction and control on the non-charity. So let me bring it real. Let me make it real uh, because examples serve me best in this way. So let's take the example of an international development charity located in Canada. Let's take the example of Farm Radio. I hope your readers know about Farm Radio, an absolutely brilliant charity working farmers and uh, helping farmers in Kenya learn about seeding, irrigation, fertilizing, harvesting. And they do this over the radio waves because that is obviously the best way to get to farmers in Kenya. But here's the kicker. In order to work with local radio stations in Kenya, farm radio has to exercise direction and control over what they do. Uh, in other words, uh, they have to tell them what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it. They have to, uh, uh, they have to, they, uh, any intellectual property that is developed by the project actually does not belong to, far, to the Kenyan organization, but to Farm Radio. There are very expensive legal arrangements that have to be made. And it can, uh, it can uh, use up a lot of the charitable money in administrative uh, uh, functions and legal functions as opposed to service functions. Uh, that's one example. You know, I'll give you another example from Canada. Uh, uh, reconciliation is on the top of mind for everyone. When a Canadian charity or a Canadian foundation wants to give money to an, an Indigenous organization that is not a charity, they have to go through the same arrangements. In other words, they have to direct and control them. I don't need to tell your listeners what those two words, direct and control, mean to Indigenous organizations. I don't need to tell your listeners what direct and control means to oversee, mean, means in the overseas context of the developing South, one way or the other, this law and the guidance around it is viewed as white saviorism in the developing world and neocolonialism in, in our country. So this law needs to change. And my proposal is to change the law in a very thoughtful and uh, in a very thoughtful uh, way so that we don't lose what is at the heart of the current law. At the heart of the current law, it's not any intention to be colonial or racist or oppressive. Frankly, you know, I think it was written at a time when nobody thought of these things. 
uh, but the the intention of the law was to be accountable for charitable dollars. So my proposal says, yes, accountability is important. We can get accountability, but we can get it differently and get it equally, but we can do it by doing business differently so that not we are not imposing these colonial uh, uh, workarounds on partners who are in the field doing good work. So that's what my law proposes to do. We will change the two words, own activities to expenditure responsibility. In other words, emancipating the sector to do two things. One, to continue to be accountable to the Canadian public for charitable dollars. That is incredibly important. But two, also to work in an empowered relationships with local partners, overseas partners, indigenous organizations, racial minority groups, all these organizations who are doing essential public good but are not charities. And maybe they should not be charities. I mean, some of them can't be charities because they're located overseas. And some of them who are in Canada, you know, are small volunteer organizations or small organizations with one or two people. They don't need to take on the burden of being charitable just to advance public good. So I think I hear you saying that this arcane, archaic law it was structured in such a way that was intended to create accountability, but what it's done is um, neocolonialism and uh, colonialism outside of um, our country instead by creating a sort of governance control yes. over this third party. Yes. So maybe you could just drill down a little more about how Bill S. 216 addresses equity issues in, in Canada's nonprofit sector. I know that it's become a topic of conversation. It, dis- it addresses equity issues like a bullseye, if I may say. Because if you take a look at uh, the charitable sector and you try and parse it out by who's a charity and who's not, you see that uh, the groups serving uh, the most vulnerable people, indigenous people, racial minority people, uh, are likely not charity. So they are prevented from accessing the charitable and philanthropic space. And I have evidence to back me up on that. Less than 1% of Canada's charitable dollars go to indigenous organizations. Less than 1% of Canada's charitable dollars go to black organizations. How is that possible? How is that possible, I ask myself? That is possible because the law makes it so. So then how would you address potential critics who have concerns about oversight and accountability? How would your bill actually address those issues? Well, I would say to them, read the bill. The bill has a whole section devoted to it that lays out exactly the upfront due diligence that must be be exercised by the sponsoring charity. It lays it out in detail, and these details would be flushed out further in uh, in the in the consultations that the CRA would carry out. It, it talks about checking reputation of the not-for-profit or non-charitable partner. It talks about previous experience in the field of the organization. It talks about upfront agreements. It talks about uh, use of funds. It talks about timelines and reporting and accountability and checkbacks and all that. It does exactly what any reasonable organization would do if it's working with a partner. But what it does not do is say that you will continue to exercise operational control throughout the project. You will do your due diligence. You will come to an agreement. You will review the reports. You will have the option as agreements of, of, uh, of, um, of, um, you know, of saying this is not working. But what you won't have the option of is directing and controlling them. Once the agreement is signed, the, the responsibility of the sponsoring char- charity becomes oversight and financial control. 
an evaluation. So what are the next steps for the bill? What, where are you in the process? What can our listeners do to, well, first off, to understand where it is in the, in the process of uh, becoming law? And uh, what are the next steps? Uh, before I get to that question, I, I want to say that um, I have been supported in this rather long and exhausting journey by a brain trust that is made up of Canada's top charity lawyers, as well as Imagine Canada, Cooperation Canada, uh, the Canadian Council of uh, Christian Churches, etc., etc. Um, and 37 of Canada's top charity lawyers, and there aren't many more than 37, I would say, maybe 45, but 37 of them who derive actually a lot of business from this law because they are responsible for, you know, uh, crafting these complicated agreements with a between a charity and a non-charity. They have written an open letter, and I would ask you to post that open letter uh, when you broadcast this show. Uh, they have written an open letter calling the current rules uh, out of date, uh, disenfranchising, and they have termed them a legal fiction. It's a legal fiction everybody participates in to get around the law. It is time for the law to get around itself, I would say. So where's my bill? I am I am very uh, excited that the bill was passed unanimously by the Senate. Senators have very uh, deep connections with charities. Almost every one of us sits on a charities board. So they approved it. Um, wholeheartedly. It is now in the House of Commons and will go through the same process uh, that it does in the Senate, which means um, that there, it, there is a sponsor of the bill, and that, that is MP Philip Lawrence, excuse me, uh, who is a member of parliament uh, from uh, Northumberland. He's a member of the Conservative Party of Canada. He's a, he is a very eager sponsor of the bill, and he will be speaking to the bill very shortly in the coming months. And then it will go to committee in the House of Commons and then come back to the House of Commons. And then with, with lots of help from, my, from the community, it will get passed and then it will be, it will be given royal assent. So that's the process. It's, it's not simple, but it's closer, uh, obviously, than when I began on this journey. And if nonprofits or nonprofit professionals want to support the bill, what what steps can they take? Uh, I think uh, this, if they are organizations or individuals, the simplest thing to do is to call your MP or to write your MP. MPs listen to constituents. So that's what they must do. Uh, I know that other charities are launching petitions. And one can sign on to those petitions as well. But there's nothing as powerful as writing a personal letter or an email to your MP in their constituency office. Nothing like that. Uh, I know that the sector is organizing uh, days on the hill uh, in which they will present on this and many other issues. But again, uh, this one is really important and we're closer to the finish line uh, so it is important to make noise about it, talk about how it impacts your organization, talk about your experiences in either exercise direction and control or being directed and controlled. Uh, talk about it, write about it, uh, social media about it, YouTube about it. So make noise in general. Okay, well, I promise I will include uh, that information, that the links that you mentioned in the show notes and also on our website where, it, where we have additional information related to uh, our podcasts. Um, I wanted to actually move on to some closing questions that relate more generally to diversity, equity and inclusion in the sector. If, if I, I can uh, take up a few more minutes of your time. Um, I wanted to ask that in, in terms of creating a more equitable nonprofit sector, what recommendations that, that you think came out of the special Senate committee's report that are truly you know, critical? I'm, I'm going to highlight two or three. Let me say two, and if we have time, we'll get to the third. 
uh, I think it is incredibly important for Canada's charities and not-for-profits to reflect the lived reality of the people they serve in their leadership. And I'm talking specifically about governance leadership. And in June of 2020, uh, when the conversation about racism uh, was at a high, I issued an open letter in The Philanthropist asking the sector to police itself, to monitor itself. Uh, and I noted that on questions of equity and inclusion, the sector takes a very good line, but doesn't walk it. And as I've observed, its spirit may be f willing, but its flesh is significantly weak. As a result of that open call, Stats Canada uh, emerged wonderfully and said, hey, Senator, we'll do a crowdsourced voluntary survey to find out whether or not the sector's governance is close to the d diversity of this country or not. And that was a godsend. And so they launched a voluntary survey in 2020, and it was completed in January of 2021. And I want to, you know, be absolutely upfront. It's a voluntary survey, so it doesn't really give you a picture of the whole sector. But 8,800 individuals responded. They told us that they were on boards of directors, and they told us which, um, which demographic group they aligned to. And, and the results were not surprising. Uh, gender is clearly not a problem in the sector. The sector does really well with uh, ensuring that women are well represented on its boards of directors. But the same is not true for immigrants. The same is not true for visible minority groups or for indigenous peoples. Uh, so my, my dedication comes again from a Senate, from the Senate Charities Report, which recommended that the that stat that the CRA include uh, a, a new question on its annual uh, return uh, T30 and T1044 returns that simply ask the question about demographic features of their boards. Tell us if your board member, how many of your board members are women, men. Tell us how many are you know, as per employment equity definitions, how many are racial minorities, how many are indigenous, how many are disabled, et cetera, et cetera. That would be a simple way of, of, of gathering the evidence, just gathering the evidence and speaking from truth as opposed to speaking from anecdotes. I think that is really important. I also want to tell your listeners that similar legislation already exists for the corporate sector in Canada. So uh, the corporate sector is bound by law, and th these are federally regulated companies, bound by law to report out every year about the governance makeup of their boards. In addition, they are bound by law to table a diversity plan. I'm not going to even go to the diversity plan. I just think we need baseline evidence. So that's a, a crucial, critical, weak link in our information systems around the sector that needs to be corrected. And this is not a law. I have tabled a motion in the Senate, and it is being debated currently. And it's sim a, a motion simply asks the government to do the right thing. It is non-legislative. There are no risks attached to it. So I'm hoping that some a reasonable minister with whose government has made a commitment to anti-racism, uh, to anti-black racism, to Islamophobia, that this government will take up this call and make this one simple, powerful addition on the CRA return. So this is, uh, this is sort of the change that would mirror the uh, Bill C-25 that, that mandated cor for-profit corporations to comply and explain? Is, is, is this what you were talking about? The oh, we, we, I'm not suggesting we go to comply and explain at this point. I'm just saying gather the evidence. 
What advocacy and future legislation can we expect to see going forward to support the sector in your mind? Well, I'm really uh, disturbed by the fact that the government's relationship with the sector is so fragmented, so siloed. Uh, you know, uh, environmental organizations speak to the minister to the Ministry of the Environment. Health organizations speak to the minister to the Ministry of Health. Uh, cultural organizations speak to Canadian Heritage, and so on and so forth. But there are underlying challenges that are shared by all sectors, by the entire sector, that cannot be resolved department by department. We need a table a common table in a department of the government that is all encompassing. And I would say it could be ESDC, it could be, you know, another department, it could be treasury, I really don't care about where, but we need a home in government and a home in government with with a small skeleton staff attached to it, whose job it would be to act as the interlocutor between the sector and all the departments of the government on overriding, overarching issues such as digital uh, technology, artificial intelligence, the human resources in, in, in the sector, uh, fairness and other things. So if we could have one table that would set the stage for these conversations, then we could also have enabling mechanisms to lift all boats, not just a, a few boats at a time. And that is why we need a home in the government. And I am really pushing for this third one. And finally, I really do like the idea of the Tax Court of Canada taking over uh, the appeals of refused organizations or revoked charities for a simple reason. The, the Tax Court is nimbler, it is faster, it is not as, as expensive as uh, the appeals court. Further, there is a legislative uh, nicety, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, but it, 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 I've learned enough about it to tell you that it does make a difference. Uh, the appeals court cannot hear new evidence on the file. It can only proceed with the evidence that is already uh, in front of it, as opposed to the tax court which can hear new evidence, which can call subject matter experts to the table and query. The result of that is, uh, the, res the, the net result is important, you know, that, that cases get heard, decisions get made, and precedents get set so that the law evolves. And this is the way our law, laws are made in one of two ways. You know, either there's a law on the books and it's allowed to evolve through judgments in the court or it is amended in, in, in Parliament. In the last 40 years, I believe, not a single appeal uh, uh, from a revoked or refused organization to the appeals court has been overturned. Not a single appeal, which means that the law is stuck in Elizabethan times. It has not moved forward. So I think this is another change that should happen. Well, I want to thank you for your uh, in amazing insights. I've learned so much today and, um, and ha have such admiration for your passion uh, to these important um, issues in the sector. And I want to extend my thanks again to you for speaking with me on Charity Village Connects, your your message is so very important to our community. Thank you so much, Mary, for having me. And Charity Village is a wonderful platform. Well, thank you very much.